All right, so here it goes. Where my hat for it? Let's be more size saga. I had a dozen made up about, I don't know, it was 15 years ago. This is the last one I had that's still actually decent. I got like three or four others that are pretty bad. But, <clears throat> so I'm going to start reading the More Sci Saga uh, one chapter at a time per video. I'm going to do commentary during it, talk about it. So whenever I break for commentary, I'm going to say commentary, and then I'll, I'll say what i got to say, and then I'll return to the story. And then however long it takes is however long it takes. Um, I'll try one. You guys let me know what you think. If you want me to continue, let me know. If you think, oh, this guy's dry as toast, then that's fine too. Anyway, so for those who may not know, I am author Brian S. Pratt. I've been writing... I've been writing fantasy epic fantasy for since 2005 so i'm coming up on this time next year i'll be on my 20 years as an author but not quite published author that'd be a december 20 uh 2000 20, 2025 will be 20 years in december so um so let me go ahead and, and get this started um here we go the Unsuspecting Mage, book one of the Morsai Saga. And you can get this for free downloads pretty much anywhere that, that ebooks are. And, and if you happen to find a spot that doesn't have a free download, look elsewhere. Apple, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. One of those will always have a free no matter what country you live in. Some Amazons don't make aren't free, but most are. So Amazon.com is free as of right now. Okay, so book one, so book one of the Morsai Saga, chapter one. Having your nose in a book may be a great way to spend your spare time unless you do it to the exclusion of everything else. You get up, grab a book, then read until night comes when you're forced to put it down for sleep. Oh sure, you have the occasional interruptions in the pattern like eating and school and such things. Must be tolerated. James Reese, commentary, Reese was my grandmother's maiden name. Uh, James... I just like the name, no particular reason why I have James, but Reese was my grandmother's uh, maiden name. Well, he was a young man in his senior year of high school who did just that. Unless something of dire importance demanded his attention, he would be found lying upon his bed deep within a current favorite book. He saw nothing wrong with spending every available moment reading. And that was me. And growing up, up until probably 20 I read two, three books a day. There was always one in my pocket. Reading to him was grand adventure, offering new ideas and kept him out of trouble. His main interest was fantasy adventures books, though he did dabble in occasional sci-fi so as not to get burnt out with fantastical worlds. Every book he ever read filled shelves which lined his walls. Now pushing over 500 titles, it was the one thing he took the most pride in. Now for me, I had over a thousand books. But I thought if I, if I put a thousand in there, people wouldn't really believe that, especially those who don't read that much. So I made it 500, but it's well over a thousand. And I still have them in storage up in Washington. I, I, I got I to gotta haul them back here. Um, an obtrusive knock brought him back from the middle of a particularly exciting battle. James came his grandmother's voice from the other side. Breakfast is almost ready. Get, re get ready or you're going to be late for school. Unable to continue, he read another three paragraphs until reaching a break, then carefully inserted a well-worn bookmark and placed the book gingerly on his nightstand. He'd read it before. Many of his books had been read several times over the years, and most were still in very good condition. Those who knew him best believed that he cared more for his books than for anything else. There were times when he thought they may be right. Some of his friends kidded him when they saw him deep within a book he had read before. Don't you ever get tired of reading the same book over and over? James just grinned and shook his head. Nope. Then he invariably asked, I suppose you've never ever watched the same movie more than once. Having made his point, he left him alone. And some books I've read six, seven, eight times. Um, the Seventh Sword by Dave Duncan, perhaps the one of the best works ever written. And one that probably unconsciously inspired a lot of the more size saga. But they're completely different stories, so there's no problem there. <clears throat> he grabbed a shirt and a pair of jeans from off the floor that didn't look too dirty and got dressed. 
After slipping on his shoes, he slung his ever-present backpack over his shoulder and left the room. The mouth-watering aroma of scrambled eggs, bacon, and biscuits filled the house. His grandmother was busy in the kitchen where she put the finishing touches on breakfast. Have a seat. It'll be ready in a minute. His grandparents raised him for the past five years, ever since his parents were killed by a drunk driver. My parents were never killed by a drunk driver. Though James is, is basically me in almost every way. Um, my grandparents didn't raise me, but I thought what what came later would come be easier if it wasn't if it was grandparents, not parents. But it, no, that's not right. It just came out that way. At the grandfather, his, his at the table, his grandfather read the morning paper. So intent was he on an article that he failed to notice his grandson taking his place at the table. James had some trepidation about disturbing his grandfather. For the last few months, his grandfather had been encouraging him to find a job. Almost daily, he pointed out ads in the paper that he felt James might be interested in. It was the senior year, and the summer was almost upon him. He knew he needed to make some decisions about his future, but had never been that great when trying new things. Some called him antisocial. He thought of, of himself as merely non-social. He didn't hate being around others. He just preferred time to himself with his books. The noise of James setting his backpack on the floor drew his grandfather's attention. James silently groaned as his grandfather leaned over to show him what was sure to be another ad that more than likely would, be, would fail to be of interest. It turned out to be anything but. Local Teen Missing Seth Randall, a teen from Haviston, was reported missing when he failed to return home Wednesday evening. The police have issued an Amber Alert, and teams of volunteers are busy combing the local area. Thus far, they have been unsuccessful. He was last seen on Wednesday afternoon on his way home from Haviston High School, where he is currently enrolled as a senior. If you have any information, please call 911. Isn't he one of your classmates? Yes, James replied, but I, don't, I didn't know how to know him very well. He's on the football team and is well liked by everyone. Hope he's okay. Further conversation was forestalled by the emergence of his grandmother from the kitchen, bearing a platter filled with eggs and bacon in one hand, and a pan that held a dozen biscuits in the other. James eagerly took charge of the biscuits and deftly transferred one to his plate, then set the warm pan on the table. He helped himself to a big portion of his grandmother's blackberry jam. It won second place at the county fair last year. Old Widow Jones took first place. His grandmother claimed that Widow Jones put too much sweet in her jams, and that is why she won every year. About to take a bite, he heard her say, James, let's say Grace first. She had that look in her eye. He gave her a sheepish grin and set the plate on his set the biscuit back on his plate folded his hands, and bowed his head for prayer. His grandfather prayed, Dear Lord, please bless this food to our good, watch over us, and guide us. And please help James find a job. In Jesus' name, amen. Leave the boy alone, John. His wife chided as she placed her napkin in her lap. He'll find one when, when the good Lord is ready. She turned her attention to James. Make sure to find one that you will be happy with. There is nothing worse than spending your life at a job that is dull and lifeless. One should come along when the time is right. Now hurry and eat, or you will be late for school again. He stuffed his mouth with eggs and bacon. I better eat on the run, then. He tucked several biscuits in a napkin and placed them in the top of his backpack. Her biscuits, especially when warm, were hard to resist. Thanks for another warm, award-winning breakfast, he said, before he gave her a peck on the cheek, and then headed for the back door. Don't forget your lunch. It's by the door. Got it, he hollered as he stuffed it in his backpack. Once out the back door, he grabbed his bike, hopped on, and quickly made his way down the road towards school. Haviston High wasn't much more than a mile away, and it only took him a few minutes to arrive. All right, commentary. Someone just chewed me up one, one way down the other on a review a few years ago, saying, No one rides their bike to school. Nobody ever rides their bike to school. Well, frankly, I rode my bike to, uh, four years of high school. Even when I got my car, I tended to ride my bike to school because I enjoyed it. Police cars, both marked and unmarked, were in and around the parking lot. Two officers stood amidst a group of students, while three officious-looking men in business attire entered the office. He pulled into the bike rack, grabbed the chain, and secured his bike. His best and only friend, Dave, arrived as he pushed the lock closed. He parked his bike in the adjacent slot. <coughs> hey, did you hear that Seth is missing? James glanced to his friend and nodded. Yeah, I saw it in the paper this morning. Wonder what happened to him. He spied a nearby police woman. Approaching the officer, officer Jay, uh, Dave asked, What's going on? We're asking students about Seth Randall. His mother said he's been missing since Wednesday evening. Would you boys know anything about it? No, replied James, who shook his head. We barely knew him. That's right, Dave added. 
They also handed each a card bearing pertinent contact information. If you see or hear anything that might help us locate him, please call. Sure. James glanced at the card. If we hear anything, we'll be, we'll be sure to let you know. Heading to class, they couldn't help but wonder what happened to Seth. The rest of the day, if anyone could talk, the rest of the day, all anyone could talk of was Seth. They had an assembly before lunch where they were told the facts that surrounded his disappearance. Evidently, he had headed downtown after school, and that was the last anyone had heard from him. They were given the standard lesson on strangers and what to do in emergencies, the basic don't talk to strangers lecture they've had for years. Lunchtime, lunchtime found James and Dave in their regular spot in the lunchroom. Both were brown bag in it, but Dave was not very enthusiastic about his lunch. He, he produced a poorly wrapped sandwich. Turning to James, he held it up. How about a trade? My mystery meat for whatever your grandmother made. James removed a six-inch homemade hoagie from his sack and smiled. <clears throat> Not on your life, bud. My stomach isn't that strong. Besides, after all these years of your mom's infamous cooking, you should be used to it by, used to it by now. Taking a bite, Dave replied, I suppose so. No use, in, no use in subjecting another to this stuff. Hearing a sigh from his friend, Dave looked over to see James looking at a small piece of paper. What's the matter? I thought I'd gotten off easy this morning. You know how my grandfather always mentions jobs he thinks I would like? When Dave nodded, he continued, Well, instead of pressing me about it this morning, he slipped one in with my lunch. He gazed at the ad as a bit, of, as he bit off a good-sized portion of his sandwich. After another bite, he said, This one is at least interesting, if a little odd. What do you mean? James offered him the ad. Here, read it. Dave wiped his hands on his pants, took the ad. Magic, real magic. Ever wanted to learn? We require someone with intelligence and a disciplined mind, those well-versed in fantasy novels and role-playing games a plus. May need to travel. Only those of good character need apply. No appointment necessary. For a preliminary interview, drop by at 1616 Commercial Ave, room 2334, Haviston, California. Well, that is different. I'll give you that, from Dave, as he handed the ad back. Putting it in his wallet, James asked, what do you think? Pausing for a moment to think while he finished a mouthful of food, Dave replied, Well, it is right down your alley. You have read more books than I could even hope to get through. I mean, play D&D every once in a while. Maybe you should look into it. You've always said you would like to travel and see the castles of England. Maybe this will be your chance. It sounds like some traveling magician or something. Yeah, you're right. Maybe I'll go down tomorrow and see what it's about. If nothing else, it should please my grandfather and maybe get him off my back at least for a day or two. Taking another bite of his hoagie, James pondered the ad, thinking it might be worth looking into. Pointing off to the right, Dave said, There's Alyssa. You should go invite her to the dance next week. You know you have a thing for her. James took a brief glance her way and sighed, I haven't quite worked out the nerve. I've tried twice, but my mouth gets all dry and I can't find the words. I'm afraid I'll look like an idiot. You need to get out of that room of yours more. Stop spending so much time in there alone with your books and start living a little more in reality. She's nice, and I believe still available. I know. Maybe I'll ask her Monday. If you ask her at all, you mean. Dave's attempts to bring him out of his room met with very little success, but he kept trying. Once they finished eating, the boys left the lunchroom and made their way to the chess room where they spent the rest of their lunch break role-playing. James usually ran the game since he enjoyed making the campaigns more than Dave did. Back in his bedroom, he had a whole collection of campaigns that had never been played. He liked designing them more than playing them. And that's true. I did that a lot. I would, uh, I mean, James's ever-present backpack, going to and from school, my backpack was always filled with uh, the Dungeon Master's Guide, um, the Fiend Folio, Player's Handbook, Dice, um, the Arduin Grimoires, you know, all that good stuff. So yeah, me and me and James were, were pretty much the same. Uh Dave, on the other hand, preferred to be the character or characters. He played a thief and a mage who were currently trying to find the Ring of Zanuck, the God of Fire. James set up his god wall and removed the dice and papers from his backpack. He always kept meticulous notes during his campaigns. Dave got his papers, dice, and the player's rule book. Once everything was ready, they began. Your mage and thief had infiltrated the Red Rogue's Lair, he began, giving a brief recap of where they had left off the day before. You had just found a flight of stairs and began to descend. On to fame and fortune, Dave exclaimed with a grin. My thief is checking for traps as they go down the steps. James nodded. No traps were found. Upon reaching the bottom step, he discovered a long hallway stretching far into the darkness ahead. 
A sound could be heard coming from out of the dark, and it seemed to be coming towards you. The rest of the day went along pretty much as usual. Classes interrupted, including the dreaded PE class that he was on the verge of flunking. He simply was not much into sports or anything else that required one to sweat. His gym, his gym teacher told him he needed to show more enthusiasm for the physical side of life, but his teacher's arguments did, little, did nothing to sway him. It's not that James was fat or anything. He actually appeared quite fit. He just didn't go for the active side of life. I hated gym. <laughs> I was the fat kid in class. You know, when he ran around the school, I was like in the last five people every time they get to the end. So yeah, I didn't care. C's. Constant C's in gym class. And I think I got those just because I showed up. After school at the bike at the bike rack, Dave informed him that he planned to accompany him to the interview for moral support, as he put it. You don't have to come with me, you know. I know. But you stand a better chance of following through if I do. James secured the chain beneath the bike, set the uh, James secured the chain beneath the bike seat, then glanced to his friend. Are you afraid I'm gonna chicken out or something like that? Dave flashed him a grin. As a matter of fact, yes, yes I am. I plan on catching the 5.12 at 9. If your sister's about coming, meet me at the bus stop. I'll be there, Dave said. All right, see you tomorrow. With that, James hopped on his bike and headed for home. At dinner, he told his grandparents about his decision to go to the interview. Now remember, James, his grandfather said, when you're at an interview, you're interviewing them as much as they are interviewing you. Never sell for conditions that, are not going to, that you are not going to like. Be assertive. James nodded his head. I will. I don't plan on making any decisions on the spot. I'm simply going there to find out about the job and how much it pays. It sounded interesting. Showing concern on her face, his grandma said, Be careful while you're there. The last place anyone saw poor Seth was headed into town. Watch yourself. A little after dinner, James was in his room reading when a rap on his door brought him out from a deep dungeon fraught with danger. Yes, he hollered, without ever removing his eyes from the pages of the book. James, you should come see this. It was his grandfather. Now he mumbled, slipping his bookmark within the pages. He set the book on his nightstand and made his way out to the living room. There he found his grandparents rapidly watching the news. Another person is missing, his grandmother said, this time a girl. Interest peaked, James sat next to her on the couch. An image of a young woman who looked to be in her teens was pictured behind the reporter. The newsman went on to say that this was the second person to come up missing in the past week. There were no leads, no connection between them. They came from different cities in the same area and disappeared without a trace. The report continued with interviews of family members of the two missing teens. This is serious, his grandfather said. You need to be extra careful tomorrow when you are downtown. I will, James assured him. He watched the report on the missing teens until the reporters began repeating themselves. Then he returned to his room where he resumed his position upon his bed and picked up his book. He found it difficult to concentrate on the story. After realizing he had read the same paragraph three times, he decided that it was a lost cause and returned the book to the nightstand. Thoughts and worries about the interview tomorrow made him far too nervous to be able to concentrate on reading. The ad continued running through his mind. Well versed in fantasy novels and role playing games. May need to travel. It sounded exciting. Maybe Dave was right. It could be a traveling magician. Different theories and thoughts ran through his mind until it was time for bed. After crawling beneath the covers, he set the alarm for 7.30 before he switched off the reading lamp. He lay in the dark and enjoyed the cool air as it drifted in through the window above his head. Eventually, sleep triumphed over tomorrow's worries and he was, uh, and he was able to fall asleep. It felt like he had no sooner fallen asleep than his alarm went off. Hit, hitting the off button, he rolled onto his back and tried unsuccessfully to keep his eyes open. He was simply way too comfortable and almost didn't have the energy to pull the covers off and get the day going. His sense of responsibility over, eventually overcame his laziness and he managed to drag himself out of bed. Also, Dave would never let him hear the end of it if he let him, wait, he let him waiting at the bus stop. After a quick shower, he threw on some of his, best, of his better clothes. Not his church clothes to be sure, but ones good enough to look nice in. Once he was dressed, he took the, his backpack and emptied his role-playing paraphernalia out of it. He put a clean handkerchief in the backpack along with the book he was currently reading. Pausing a moment, he decided to take the two candy bars that laid in the pile on his bed and place them inside as well. Shouldering his ever-present backpack, he opened the door and went to see about breakfast. Sausage, eggs, and biscuits were already on the table. His grandparents were nice enough to wait for him before eating. My, don't you look nice, his grandmother said. Coming to the table, he gave her a grin. 
Thanks. I better eat on the run or I might miss my bus. He threw together two sausage, egg, and biscuit sandwiches, wrapping them in a napkin. His grandmother's good luck, James, followed him through the door. He hurried down the road to the bus stop where he could catch the 512, managing to finish his breakfast on the way. Dave was already there. Good morning, offered a cheerful Dave. He always had been a morning person, which usually irritated James. Now, now that's totally opposite. I am a thorough morning, morning person. I'm up, boom, I'm, I'm out of bed, and I'm ready to go. Drives my girlfriend crazy. She is not a morning person, and I think she'd rather like to kill me in the morning because I'm like, hey, honey, let's get up. And she, and she just groans at me, gives me the look, and I go, all right, fine. And then, and then I, I, I go out and do something while, while she turns, sleeps for another hour or something. <clears throat> All right. Good morning, offered a cheerful, net, a cheerful Dave. Good morning yourself, growled James somewhat moodily. He definitely was not a morning person. Keeping an eye out for the bus. Just a second here. Okay. Keeping an eye out for the bus, Dave said, I hear they have a new laser tag area at the arcade. Want to try it after your interview? The loser pays for lunch. You're on. I can almost taste the burgers now, boasted James, as he, too, kept a lookout for the 512. When he saw it turn the corner, he announced, Here it comes! Picking up his backpack, he ready to board the bus. The 512 came to a stop, and they waited a moment while an elderly woman departed. Showing the driver their passes, they moved to the back of the bus and took their seats. The 512 would take them most of the way. They would transfer to the 33 for the last leg to Commercial Avenue. When the bus pulled out of the stop, Dave glanced to James. Nervous? A little. I'm glad you decided to come along. It's part of the reason I am even here. When I woke up this morning, all I wanted to do was lay there. But knowing you were going to be at the bus stop waiting for me, helped me get me out of bed. I thought so. <laughs> That's why I'm here, Dave grinned. He was glad he could help his friend. You know, Dave began after a few minutes, you didn't have to go and kill my thief that way. Feigning indignation, James asked, What do you mean? Is it my fault the guy had an IQ of a turnip? He never sh sh should have rushed in like that. He was greedy. Maybe, but I've been playing him for over a month now. He was all the way to level five. Oh, well, that's life. As they got closer, James t turned quieter as he dwelled more upon the un upcoming interview. Dave made a couple attempts to get him interested in further conversation, but his mind really wasn't in on it. Finally, Dave gave up and they rode the rest of the way in silence. When the park and ride was announced where they needed to transfer to the 33, James grabbed his backpack and pulled the cord. When the bus pulled in, they disembarked and went to a nearby water fountain for a drink. Dave glanced at his watch. About five minutes before the 33 shows up, the 33 did a loop through downtown and passed right down Commercial Avenue. Going over to berth 4 where they would board, J James and Dave stood in line behind several other passengers. Dave nudged James when he saw a pretty girl wearing short shorts and a snug t-shirt, but James was too preoccupied with his interview ahead to pay much attention. The, the mere thought of the interview made his, made his stomach do flip-flops. Once the 33 arrived, they boarded and took the last leg to Commercial Avenue. Had James been alone, he would have stayed on the bus. <laughs> but since Dave was there, he pulled the cord as a tall building bearing the number 1616 came into view. The bus pulled to the curb at the next stop half a block away. Butterflies were congregating at James's Mill as he stepped to the sidewalk and turned towards 1616 Commercial. Now... I have social anxiety really bad. I mean, back when I was James's age, it was almost crippling. But now it's gotten a lot better. Um, I still have a hard time going up to people. Um, but if someone con talks to me, I, I can talk back, no problem now. But going up to a pretty girl back then was almost <laughs> almost impossible. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Dave slapped him on the shoulder. Come on, it won't be that bad. James gave him a half-hearted grin and nodded. The butterflies in the stomach were turning into vampire bats. Passing through the front door, they crossed the lobby en route to the elevators, and Dave pressed the up button. While they waited, Dave noticed James looking at the building's list of businesses. When he moved to join his friend, James glanced at him. There's no listing for 2334. Dave shrugged, said, maybe they just moved in and haven't had time to get the sign adjusted. You're probably right. Or maybe they don't want to advertise who they are. That way, if they are well-known and rich, applicants won't know to ask for more pay. Shaking his head, Dave says, You and your conspiracy theories. You always think someone is playing an angle or something. Shrudging, James, James just smiled. Ding! The elevator door opened, and they entered along with several others. James pressed the button for the 23rd floor. It took a few minutes before they arrived, as the elevator made several stops to allow people on and off. By the time they reached the 23rd floor, they were the only ones remaining. 
another ding, and the door opened. Stepping out, they turned down the hallway to the right and came to the door marked 2334. James paused at the door. He turned to Dave. Should I knock or what? Ah, just going in. Marshalling his courage, James opened the door and entered. Dave followed right behind. The room was empty except for several chairs and two end tables, each boasting a neat pile of magazines and a couple of books. Across the room, a door stood closed. It bore a sign saying private in bold letters. I guess we should sit down and wait. Dave glanced at the door. How are they, how are they going to know we're here? There's probably no alarm to let them know somebody's here. So they will likely be out in a minute. Looking through the material on a nearby table, James failed to find anything of interest, so he crossed the room to the table next to the door marked private. Lying atop the table, or sorry, lying atop the other reading material, sat a small brown book with a peculiar design inscribed in gold leaf upon the cover. Intrigued, he picked up the book but quickly let it go when the, when the contact resulted in a shock of static electricity. The book hit the edge of the table and crumbled to the floor. It landed on its edge and a piece of paper slipped out. The paper was folded in half. Curious, he picked it up and opened it. Welcome and thank you for coming. Glad you found the book. If you would read the first page and then walk through the door, we can begin the interview. If you brought anything with you, feel free to bring it along. James picked up the book and looked at it with interest. He turned to Dave and showed him the book and letter. Look at this. When Dave joined him, he handed him the letter. While Dave read, James said, that's a dumb way to start an interview. What if I had never found that piece of paper? I could have been sitting here for a long time. Dave looked up from the letter and stretched, you're right. This guy must be some kind of eccentric or something. In the ad, he mentioned role-playing games. Maybe in his mind, this is some kind of test. Nodding in agreement, James sat in one of the chairs and opened the book to the first page. Underlying principles of magic. The principles of magic, the practice of magic is quite simple and basic. Magic is the process by which an individual taps into a reservoir of strength or power within himself and manifests it into changes of the world around him. Each individual contains the ability to manipulate this power. Some have the ability to do very little, while others can literally bring down mountains. Looking up in the book, James turned to his friend. Unless I'm not mistaken, this book is going to explain the workings of a magic system. Not Houdini type, and more along the lines of Merlin or Gandalf. It's talking about using the power within you to manipulate the world around you. Weird. This guy must be a nut, Dave joked. Yeah, but character or not, a job's a job. Turning back to the book, James finished the first page quickly. Closing the book, he climbed to his feet, and the vampire bats returned in full measure. He glanced to the door marked private. Sighing, he turned to his friend. Wish me luck. Good luck, replied Dave, and gave his friend an encouraging thumbs up. Slinging his backpack over his shoulder, he gathered his courage, tucked the book under his arm, and headed for the door. <clears throat> pausing, pausing momentarily, he took a few deep breaths, a few deep, soothing breaths to calm his nerves, then opened the door and stepped through. The crunch of dried leaves beneath his, beneath his foot, coupled with the scene before him, brought him to a stunned and sudden stop. A meadow nestled within a forest of trees stretched before him. Bird song filled the air, and the wafting of a gentle breeze only added to the impossibility of it. Off to his right warbled a babbling brook that cut its way through the heart of this pastoral scene. He, rem he remained rooted in dumbfound shock as, it, as his brain tried to make sense of what he saw. He turned to ask Dave if he was hallucinating, but instead, but instead received another surprise. The doorway he had just passed through was no longer there. Instead, a stand of trees rose majestically to the sky not ten feet away. Did I just cross into the twilight zone? Unable to believe what his eyes told him, he rubbed them and then looked around the clearing. Trees, trees swayed in the gentle breeze. Birds soared against the backdrop of blue sky above. The soft, trickling melody of the stream as across the meadow gave this place a surreal feel. Movement out of the corner of his eye drew his attention to the far side of the stream near a fallen log at the edge of the forest. What he saw nearly convinced him that he had lost his mind. Sitting atop the log was a strange little creature, about four and a half feet in height, with skin a dark greenish color. Wearing a blue vest and a crazy felt hat, it looked, like, it looked out of place in such a pastoral scene. Intelligence peered out from behind eyes of yellow, and they stared right at James. I'm having a hallucination. This can't be real. Unsure what to do, he walked through the grass toward the he walked through the grass of the meadow toward the creature. He paused at the stream in wary apprehension when he saw the creature hop up a log and get to his feet. When no hostile action was forthcoming, 
He leaped across the water and walked the few remaining feet until stopping before the creature. Staring to those yellow eyes nearly unnerved James completely. Somehow he managed the courage to say hello. To his utter astonishment, the creature replied with a coherent hello. James, I wide surprised. You can talk. Putting hands on hips. The creature expressed the creature's expression transformed into one that could only be considered sour. Of course I can talk. Any intelligent creature can talk, but not many have anything worthwhile to say. Before James got out his next question, the creature said, Where am I? Was that to be your next question? You're not where you started at, boy. My master sent me here to get you started, and that is all I intend to do. I am not here to hold your hand or wet nurse you. Do you understand? The creature gave him an intent look as it waited for a response. Nodding his head, James replied, I, I think so. Good. Now listen up and listen well. I am here to tell you some things, and I will only tell you once. The creature held up a finger. First of all, magic works here. Re read the book you have in your hand. It will help you get a handle on it. Your survival may well depend on it. Scratch that. Your survival will depend on it. Secondly, you can't go home. At least not right now. Don't try. We won't stop you. But take it on faith that the way is simply not open to you. Lastly, get your sorry butt to the village of Trendle. With that, the creature leaped backwards into the air and with a faint popping noise, disappeared. James, old boy, he thought to himself, you're screwed. And that's the end of the first chapter. So, yeah, it went pretty well the way I wanted it to. See, I had been reading, when I started the, the, this book, I had been reading stories that took forever to get to the action. I um, mean, anyone out there, Thomas Covenant, the Unbeliever, anybody? Okay. Great series, but it just takes, it just takes a long time to actually get to the land. I Me, mean, I wanted, I wanted to be there in the first chapter. I want, I wanted something interesting to happen, and so people just wouldn't have to go like, Ugh, how long is this going to go before something happens? <clears throat> so that, 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 that's it. And I wanted a, uh, I'm a role player, big time role player. I, I've been doing role playing since D and D started, and so I. Write what you know. So I wrote about it. I wrote about a young role player, basically me in my younger years, and going for a job in this land. And so James is basically me, and everything I would do, James would do. So I figured that that was one way to make sure he remained consistent throughout throughout the series. Because if I wouldn't do it, James wouldn't do it. And James's reactions would be my reactions. At least I think they would be. But being in the moment, you never know. Well, that's the first chapter. If this is the first time you've heard of the Morsai Saga, or the Unspecting Maze, like I said earlier, go to, to any Amazon, um, Barnes & Noble, Apple, any online ebook retailer, and download your free copy. It's a full-length novel. Give it a shot. Um, I would appreciate it if people would comment, uh, let me know if this is worthwhile, if I should continue this. And if so, I'll do another one tomorrow. I'll try to do one a day. Hopefully my reading isn't too bad. And, um, I guess that's it. If you guys have any questions, put, put them in the comments. <clears throat> I'll, I, I re I'll read every comment and I will, um, if I get enough questions, I'll, I guess I'll do like an interview one where I where I'll, I'll read the questions and then answer them as best I can. So there you go.